your first thing that you've directed, your directorial debut, mm. I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. Did, was it always you're in your head from the start that this would be a massive project that no, has was, that feel? I was tricked into it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I was never going to direct it, and then they said, it's going to be in Patalbert, and then I had to direct it. <laughs> um, well, the, the original seed of the idea, I mean, it started back in 2017, I think. <laughs> Uh, different world then. Uh, and the original seed of the idea was I, I had this idea about watching a British family being uprooted and you didn't know why and having to kind of flee their homes and go on the journey across Britain and then get across the channel. So it was a sort of refugee journey in reverse to the way we normally see it. And that was the seed of the idea. And you wouldn't know what, what was going on around them. Uh, it would be very sort of kinetic, subjective kind of thing. And then uh, that was the idea I brought to Beth Ann, uh, our producer. Uh, and then we talked about, well, what, what if we did look into what is going on? Um, and, uh, uh, and so then I thought, well, who would be a good person to talk to about that? Um, and being a huge fan of Adam's documentaries, uh, I always felt like he has such a sort of brilliant insight into what's going on under the skin of a culture or a moment in history and the connections and the undercurrents uh, 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 of what's going on. So I got in touch with Adam uh, and he very kindly agreed to talk to me about it. And uh, by the end of that conversation, I knew two things. I knew that is definitely the way we should go. <laughs> um, and I knew that it would be brilliant to have Adam be part of the of the journey. And, and he incredibly kindly and surprisingly um, uh, said yes. Um, and I suppose at that point, it became epic. <laughs> and then we needed someone who could write that and who, was, who could handle the epic and the kind of state of the nation and the big issues and the big questions, but at the same time was really good at a human story and warmth and, and humor uh, and the kind of everyday and James they weren't available so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so James's work you know just sort of has all of that in spades and so once we had that group together we started sort of developing the story and and Adam from the very beginning was always um very strong on the idea that it, uh, what happens ultimately where we get to at the end of that first episode has to be believable. We have to believe where this has come from. And so we talked a lot about, well, what element should be in place there, where it should happen and, what, and what's the history of that place and those people and that community. And out of that conversation came the idea that it, it should be put Albert. Um, and then I had no choice in the matter. <laughs> um, Adam, let's come to you then. So, this is an unusual project for you, because obviously we're used to doing your heavily authored, your, your fascinating documentary films. So when Michael came along to speak to you about this, what was your initial reaction? Did you, was it something that you thought, oh yeah, I can get involved in this? Or, or what, was your, what was your feeling um, about it? Well, I thought, I mean, I thought it was an interesting idea, the idea of actually, we're so disconnected at the moment from what's going on outside. The, I, I like the idea of what's it like to flee in your own country. The immediate question in my brain went, well, what are they fleeing from? You know, what is the uprising that they're... That, that was the question I asked myself. And why I then wanted to get involved is because I thought it, one could explore in a different way than I would normally do a thing that's always puzzled me, which is why we live in a society where both on the right and the left there is great dissatisfaction with the present state of affairs, this sense of stuckness, and people want to move on. But it never happens. It always rises up, like there was Occupy, faded away. There was Brexit, failed. There was uh, Corbyn, failed. There was Liz Truss, radical, <coughs> failed. <laughs> but she was. I mean, you know, she was taking on an economic establishment, failed. Why does it always fail? And I thought what would be interesting in this would be a way to explore why, when we live in a world, a society which wants to have change, left and right, why does it never happen? Why are we stuck? And I just thought exploring it through a drama would be really good. And that's what James did, because he took that idea <coughs> and put it in, not just in terms of society, but what is actually holding individuals back in a family. What are the ghosts that hold them back, as well as the bigger ghosts that hold us back? So that's why I wanted to be involved. Mm. And James, from your point of view, this feels like, if, you know, we've known your work dealing with working class communities and, um, families driven by political disagreements in Sherwood particularly, series two coming soon. Um, 
But this has a very different tone, doesn't it? Is, is the tone key to this? What strikes me is it, it's kind of all over the place, but in a brilliant way, like part kind of almost like horror to it. There's like a, the, the music gives it a kind of sci-fi feel and yet there's social realism as well. Was that, was that always there that you wanted to kind of mix these, all of these different genres? Yeah, that felt really key. I can't actually remember now, sort of chicken and egg, how that tone and the style came about. I mean, we all, we talk collectively about not wanting a traditional dystopian future, which was which was really grim and bleak um, and guided by Im imagining sort of AI tech disasters. Uh, I think we all got excited by imagining the reverse of that. Like, what if it was, as Adam used the word, ghosts? What, it, what if it was the myths and the legends and the folklores? that embed themselves in our national psyche and either uh, often they're meant to liberate us, but do they trap us? Do they, do, do they inhibit us? Do they stop us from doing that radical change that I think was in the mood when we started um, drawing up this plan? Um, and then I guess really weirdly, I just got really excited about, um, yeah, that, that sort of cross-contamination of genres like we didn't want it just to be sort of social realism kitchen sink we didn't want it to be I mean, I'm very excited for you to see the second and third episode because we go into um, I guess the second episode we thought of as like a road movie or like an adventure movie on foot so you, you start to see these elements of um, the myths and legends that the, the family carry with them become those stories we grew up with like uh, Watership Down and Wizard of Oz and it becomes very fantastical and weird in the way that we all carry these stories with us and that's how we frame and make sense of the world. Um, so that's what kind of liberated us of it not just being a apocalyptic drama, um, that we wanted a bit of irony and wit and juxtaposition and uh, to smash kitchen sink drama with um, conspiracy theories and um, childhood fairy tales and folklores and that just felt so exciting and, and um, and Patalbert, it, uh, I don't want to speak on Patalbert's behalf, Michael. Um, because that's my job. Because I should have. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I grew up in a sort of a similar sort of industrial um, community that has a heritage and its, its uh, idea of itself is a big part of its identity. Um, and um, in a way, I guess that it felt natural that the stories and the history and the identity, uh, issues of class and, and history and uh, struggle would naturally inform the question which I loved initially was, how would it happen here? How, how could what we see happening um, in different countries around the world, how would it ever happen here? And I suppose one of the things from the beginning as well that we always talked about, or that I certainly wanted to happen, was that I wanted the experience of, of watching it for the audience to feel like what it has felt like for the last 10 years of living in our society, where uh, you don't know if you're in a horror film or a sitcom <laughs> and something something that feels life and death stakes suddenly goes incredibly surreal and absurd and then goes back to being incredibly scary again. So that feeling of the twists and turns of it and tonally, I think we all felt very strongly that we wanted it to be tonally all over the place in a good way, not to conform to smoothing things yes. out too much. Uh, I kept on banging on about that actually it, it's, it is the social realism. The social realism that we have grown up with doesn't actually reflect how people really experience the world these days. The way people experience the world these days, all of us, is in this sort of strange, hazy, fluxy way. Just things come and go. And there's no logic to it. And we know those in power don't really know why they come and why they go. So it's that haziness and fluxiness is actually the realism of our age. And I kept on that, this is what we should be doing. It's that feel. So it's not actually... It is social realism in a funny sort of mm. way for our time. That's what I mm. think. And the and the idea that the this family and and as the episodes go on, you you sort of we we go more into this. But this this family are haunted, literally haunted by their past. What has happened to each of them as a family? But the the place is haunted as well. And you know, in certain aspects, even though I'm not really a ghost, but you know, the the ghosts are starting to walk the streets again. But I also wanted the piece itself to feel like it's haunted. So, you know, the, the soundtrack is like John Carpenter or Tangerine Dream from the 80s. The, the way we shoot things like the town hall scene is, is completely Alan J. Pecula from the 70s. I didn't want it to bang people over the head with it, but I just want that feeling of that the archival footage feels like it's sort of haunting and that the whole, feel, the whole piece feels like it's sort of haunted. Um, and that obviously starts to come more and more out into the second and third episodes as well. 
and visually, it does feel like it's influenced by Adam's work. Is that would you, would you is that is that too kind of simplistic of me oh, to no. think that? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Adam's stuff is in it. Right. You know, the <laughs> Adam shot stuff, so it's in there, and um, and Adam's influence was huge, both just you know as me as a fan, but also in terms of the development, the story. He was always provoking us to come at things in a different way, to see things slightly differently, and uh, and then through the edit as well. You know, always his influence was 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 huge on it. So. Um, yeah, I mean the three of us. It was a you know complete collaboration. And the music, just the music is extraordinary. Yes, that's Kian Kieron from uh, the Super Furry Animals. Who was from the Super Furry Animals, uh, and he was the composer. There's a, a few other little bits and pieces in there, but his is mm. the the main piece. And I you know I said from the beginning I want it to be like a sort of lo-fi '80s. You do it in your bedroom, John Carpenter, Tangerine <coughs> Dream kind of feel. We wanted that sort of dreamlike thing. But like I said, also I don't something about that seemed right for Patalbert and and felt right for that kind of hazy feel that Adam's talking about. And at the same time, gives you a sense <clears throat> without necessarily being able to put your finger on it, that you're sort of watching something from the past mm. and yet it sort of feels contemporary as well and, and does everything that you need it to do, you know, in terms of the emotion and the, and the, and the atmosphere. Absolutely. Callum, the, the, the story starts with you narrating, uh, which is fascinating. When you were sent the script and you read it, what did you, what did you think of that, this, this extraordinary thing? I was I just thought it was so cool to like start with like a like a narration. I was like, come on, like like it was it was really um exciting for me, and I'd never you know I'd never done anything like that before. I did like a rough recording of it in the during the shoot, but you weren't happy with that with the, with the rough recording, so we had to do it again in ADR. What did you do wrong? <laughs> no, I did, I mean Michael wasn't even in the room when I recorded it the first time. Um, uh, but then, but then I, but then I, we, we did it in ADR, and, and and that's 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 the the version we see in the, in the show. But um, yeah, got it. I think the script I was like fascinated by because, like even tonally, when you read it, it's it's so many things, and and I was so um excited by Owen, like the character. I feel like he's so many boys I know, um, who I grew up with, who I've seen, and who I've seen, who I, who I still see now when I'm when I'm home. So yeah, it's um. I was so excited to represent that and represent um, home. It was it was something uh, that was yeah thrilling really. He talks about I think how kind of numb he is at the, mm. at the beginning, and, and all the way through. The more you see him, the more you realise he's off to these hits as he describes it. And that that's fascinating. Like filming those scenes, like the scene at the end where he suddenly decides to join in. Yeah. The the um the kind of riot. Yeah, he says in the script, in James put something like um he. Yeah, we don't know why at this point, but he's feel he's, he's he's he feels he's feeling something. He's he's there now and he's present. And 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 now for me, kind of said everything. Like he doesn't he doesn't even know why he's rioting, but he's doing it. And that was something that I really kind of threw myself into. And and um, Michael was was great at kind of allowing me to do that. It was um, yeah, it was those riot scenes are so fun. <laughs> like we just got to go nuts, you know. I was gonna say that. Yeah. It was, uh, <coughs> I headbutted a riot shield. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that throwing of the tubing thing is, is like 2001. Is that mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and where, as, it, as, as that tube, uh, scaff, it's a scaff pole, the whole section of this story that got cut. Uh -huh. But that, <laughs> there's a scaff pole that, comes, that flies, and then as it is about to hit the police car window and it flashes, there's a flash, and then it freezes. I've completely stolen that from the beginning of King of Comedy. Wow. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're going to steal from anyone, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. yeah. And we shot those the riot scene, the two sort of riot scenes, we shot on the two hottest days of the year. Oh. I mean, it was boiling, and people were in the riot gear, and I'm, I mean, they were amazing. Those people, absolutely amazing. But when I, but I, I used um, things like the Battle of Augury from the Miner Strike as sort of reference points for it. Of course, when I watched the footage of the Miner Strike, I'm not. It's boiling hot. It was everyone's got their tops mm. off, and so it was a sort of weird coincidence that um, we had the same sort of weather, which is sort of strange. Absolutely, um, Stefan Jeff is is a, a fascinating character, an absolutely complicated and complex figure. What's your take on it? Uh, well, he. I mean, I, I'm fascinated myself by being um, uh, a son and a father at the same time, and I think that's what you know. One of the things that really drew me to him, you know, the ghost of the father. My father uh, died quite some years ago, but I, I sort of still feel haunted by him, and I have a son as well. And so, um, and I'm from eight miles from from Patolba, um, a place called Morrison, which, in a sense, is um, 
the industry left Morriston a long time ago and is almost what um, Port Talbot might become without the industry. You know, there's a sense of that ghostliness. Um, so that that drew me as well. But um, as as has been alluded to, it's not just the story about Port Talbot and about a strike. Uh, that was a, the device, in a sense, to set up the story of the family who, as Michael said at the beginning, are on the run, you know? And I think I was really drawn to that. There's a film, she's gonna be embarrassed to say it now, but there's a film called Sky and Ground that I've watched many times because my partner made it. And it's a documentary film about a Syrian family who have to flee their home in 2016. And I've watched it about six times because I have to go to festivals and things with her. And um, what this story does very much, I was, I was constantly reminded of the reality in that film in, in this, dramatic script because it's we sort of I don't know who it was coined this word dom epic you know because we kept saying it's domestic and it's epic you know it's dom and and in in that documentary I, I really could see the 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 way that a family has to come to terms with their own story within this vast scale and and, and the decisions they have to make on the run and the the enormity of those decisions and that's what that's what this family have to do so um as much as the the the, the setting that you've seen in this first episode, that um, that that fleeing of home and what it means and the, the myths that you carry with you then, uh, as a you know from from your culture and your society, but also within your own little family and the, the stories you tell each other and how you get through, how you form bonds, fight, pull apart. You know this whole dynamic that is seen right through until the, the conclusion that is in episode three. So yeah, it's um, it was an absolute gift. And Michael and I have known each other since I'm a little bit older than him. He was 14 and I was 16. And we joined the, the West Glamorgan Youth Theatre with each other, with the late Godfrey Evans. And our first day was, uh, you know, it was uh, we, we both joined on the same day. And, um, but I've never actually worked with him professionally. So, you know, 40 like odd being, years later, you know. Do you like being directed by him? A nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was, it was great. It was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, you know, there was so much of him in it. And, he, you know, you go, I mean, the, you see a bit of Potobo. The one bit you didn't see is the, is the one massive wall with a mural of him on it that somebody painted. So. <laughs> oh, I tried to get it in. So. <laughs> He's, you know, he's a, just yeah. a, a town legend wherever he goes. Everybody absolutely adores him, and quite rightly so, you know. <laughs> and Marley, the relationship with, with, between the two of you, Dee and, and Jeff, is fascinating. That, that Dee is very judgmental of him, really, isn't she? That for not being radical enough. Yeah. And Dee is such a fascinating, radical character. You must, when you read those speeches, what do you think, for a start, that you get to do these great orations? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I come from a family of miners, so that helps. Um, my maternal grandfather used to rescue people from collapsed mines and died of black lung. And my grandmother didn't get a pension because he wasn't officially a miner. Uh, so I come from a family of people that have struggled. So when I read the script, um, initially I was given three scenes. Uh, and as soon as I read it, um, I just, I was desperate to be a part of it really. I felt like I, I, I know who she is. She, you know, she's my grandmother, she's my mother. She's part of me and hopefully a part of my, my daughter as well, you know, that kind of women that have had to face struggles and, and, and push their families forward to survive. Um, and with regards to our relationship, I've worked, worked with Steph many times before. Um, and yeah, we join them when she's desperate to kind of get the divorce papers signed and to move on. And then he's stagnant in her eyes and doesn't move forward. And she's extremely frustrated by that, but she's come, you know, she loves him dearly, um, but he's he's not the person that she married. She kind of openly scoffs at the idea that he's the leader of the family or the patriarch. Of the <laughs> yeah, well, if Sophie Melba was here, there'd be another mm -hmm. scuffle as well, because uh, Sophie um, uh, is, is fantastically strong. And um, yeah, I think Dee thinks she wears the trousers. Maybe the women feel that they wear the trousers. And what was it like filming those scenes where you do these great speeches, where you give these great speeches? Well, it was boiling and um, <laughs> there were loads of people and it was the people in the community. And of course, I knew what was going to come out of my mouth by the wonderful James. Luckily, I didn't have to improvise those big speeches. Um, and there was a real feeling in that room mm. because those people have been through struggles and are continuing to go through struggles. So it, it felt really real and it was easy to then bounce off 
the fellow actors in the room, but also the the essays within the room itself, because um, it just felt very li- alive, mm. um, which was was wonderful. Really, really helpful to have all the community around us during those scenes. We had a lot of supporting arts, a lot of what we called used to call extras, and in, in yeah. that really helps give it that feeling. Oh, I mean, they make all the difference. I think mm. in terms of making it believable, scenes like <clears throat> obviously the riot scenes and all that, but. The, um, that town hall scene, which is a kind of anchor scene of the whole episode. And um, when we, so I, like I say, it was one of the hottest days of the year. It was boiling in that room. We were there all day. All those people were in there. And um, I remember saying, when we first sort of did a run through of the scene, I didn't tell everyone what the story of the show was or anything about it. I said, we'll just run the scene and the actors will do the lines and just listen to it and you know start reacting how, however you feel. And by the end of it, they were like, well, we know exactly what that is, because it was the story of what was going on for the town at that time anyway. So so the reactions of people, I just said to Bobby, our, our cinematographer, I said, we've just got to try and capture everyone we can <laughs> as much as possible to get that authentic feel. And I feel like it really, you know, it makes a massive difference. Yeah. My, uh, I guess your character, Anna, is the outsider in, in the group, the non-Welsh um, character. What did you? What did you? A. What did you make of her? And what did you make of filming with these great people and filming in Port Talbot? Oh my god, that's such a big question. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, well, she's fascinating. I was actually speaking to James the other day, and I was saying, you know, when I read her bio to begin with, because you always get the bio first, I was like, yes, I know this story, and not often you actually, you know, as an actor, you're blessed with a story that feels so real. Then I got the episode and on the paper, even she seemed extremely real. And I feel like part of that was the fact that she's a migrant and that kind of experience was very familiar to me myself. You know, when I saw her story, I was like, you know, this is exactly what I did. I, she is, I call it an internet migrant. When you find an opportunity online and you just go for it. Not so, it doesn't really happen often nowadays because of the fees and everything. It's absolutely horrible. Um, but it used to happen much more in like, what, 2010? And the fact that Anna did it, actually, and, you know, it's set nowadays, the show, um, finding herself a scholarship or <laughs> however else she managed to get herself to Swansea. It's fascinating. So, um, and in terms of her being in Swansea, I think, you know, I was getting a lot of questions um, about Anna and, you know, does she fit into the family? How does she fit in? And a lot of her story is the fact that she's not really fitting in. But it's interesting because, you know, her story is a story of belonging and it's a constant question mark. There isn't really an end. So when I'm trying to think, okay, how does she fit in? Does she fit in? There isn't really a yes or no answer. Um, And, you know, but to be fair, when I do want to think of somewhere where she does fit in, it is Wales and you see it even in the scenes that she was given, you know, she finds it really easy to connect with the sea. You know, it was, I I assume, her choice to go to the seaside for the little date. Um, (laughs) So I think she does fit into Wales um, very well. And, you know, shooting itself in Wales with this amazing lot and the crew and everyone else, I felt like every day I was just experiencing amazing, you know, Welsh identity in the landscape and in the people and the fact that, you know, everyone here got an opportunity to perform in their own country and perform, you know, such an important story. I feel like I got the best of people as well. So that was brilliant. And Anna's relationship with Owen is fascinating because she it feels like she's like initially doesn't want to get involved with him, particularly emotionally, but but is drawn in by him. What do you think? What do you think how that, how, how that relationship develops? <laughs> Michael, you said something when we had a rehearsal, do you remember? What did you say? Um, they drawn to each other darkness. Yeah. Dark draw- calls, no, deep calls to deep. Deep calls to deep, sorry. director once That's about when I was say. doing Hamlet. About, about <laughs> deep calls to deep, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. I think for Anna, she finds it quite difficult to connect to people. Um, and I think it's understandable, you know, I mean, especially now, you know, this story is set post-Brexit. Um, so she's in Swansea, she's working. Um, it's difficult, you know, even thinking about, I remember when I moved, you know, and all of a sudden everything was five times more expensive because that's the exchange currency. So everything is like this. 
um, so she's finding her language. She's, um, you know, finding friends. I'm not sure if she's finding friends, not really, um, because she's finding herself through whatever else she can. And there's something about Owen, and I think it's like a certain lack of something. You lack, your character lacks so much, and Anna does as well. And they're different things, but somehow you connect. Mm. Yeah, she deals with the uh, when when Owen breaks the news that he sends you know new pictures of himself on, on, on social apps, shall we say? Does she yeah. just completely matter of fact deals with that, doesn't she? I thought it was fantastic. She yeah, can't. completely. Yeah. It was very matter of fact, and we kind of assumed she does it all the time. That's what we established yeah. in rehearsals. Yeah. Well, she she sends photos. As well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, does she? Is that D doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> What did you make of that? What did you make of that scene, Cal? That's fascinating, isn't it? That? Yeah, that that was one of my um my my self tape um scenes, and and um yeah, it's it's a you know it's a hell of a line that you know when he, that he comes out with, but like it was really in, like I loved meeting Michael and chatting through it because you know you know for that that's you kind of brushed upon earlier, but yeah, like those hits for him are the, is how he tries to connect with the world and how he tries to you know yeah feel in his own words feel something and and you know like. It, yeah, I, I did a lot of work in kind of what that meant to me and 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 how I you know how I connect to Owen. It's, you know, it's, it's it's complex stuff. But um, Michael and i not working with Michael and working with Maya really kind of um help you know help to kind of make that truthful and, and honest. And you know, James's writing is so awesome. Like it's every page is so brilliant and full of life and subtext and all the things you want as an actor. So yeah, I, I am. The I thing know. I always felt with the character of Owen was that even though he says early on that he hasn't felt anything for a long time, the, the, the actual problem is that he feels too much mm -hmm. and he just doesn't know where to put it. And as the story goes along, you see a development uh, of, of the theme of a generational thing going on between Denny, Jeff and Owen. And what is it to be a leader? What is it to do? What, what, what do you do with passion, fire, anger? sense of rage whatever it is like what what do you do with that where can that go how can that be made positive and with you know Denny we hear in episode one that he was a leader and and he felt so guilty about losing and leading people that he couldn't handle it and he killed himself Jeff has grown up with a with a with a father who was a kind of legend in the town but the message he left his son was I got it wrong so Jeff is sort of what does he do with that that he that is his legacy and he doesn't know what to do and he's sort of stuck and then owen has all this going on and it's turned in on himself somehow and so we see that kind of working its way through in the story particularly in the next few mm -hmm. episodes and all these characters when we meet them in the in episode one their stories are keeping them apart they've all got their story of how they've been wronged or how this has happened or that you know they're angry about this and those stories are keeping them apart and circumstances forces them all to come together and those stories are combustible. Mm -hmm. And so we see in the second episode, those stories blowing up. And then as we go on into the third episode, because that has happened, there is the possibility of starting to pick the pieces up and maybe there's a way to reconnect. And maybe it's in surprising ways and not the ways that you would necessarily think it would be. But that is the kind of progression of the story. And it's about the idea of, can you let go of your stories? Our stories are a comfort to us. They can help us in all kinds of ways, but they can also hold us back. And that's both for a family and a culture. Um, and we see that throughout the whole story. And that was something that obviously Adam and James and I talked about a lot. Okay, I just want to say as well, what you're saying about the, the family uh, sounds to me like the metaphor for Wales in, in a sense of, you know, the, the, the myths that we pass on to each other and how you deal with that. But also just to represent her because she's not here as well. It just struck me when you were talking what a genius move it was to make Sophie, the, um, uh, Thea, the, the daughter, a policewoman, mm -hmm. you know, to represent the establishment and, um, you know, what, what, what is trying to suppress the, the workers and so on. Do you know what I mean? It just added to that whole kind of dynamic within the conflict of the family, I think, didn't it? Yeah, I was, I, I'm lucky enough to see an episode two and how that plays out in episode two is fascinating. So a, a friend of mine uh, reminded me that um, was something that Mike Tyson said, which is because people kept saying to me about, you know, coming to direct, you know, as long as you've got a plan, 
you'll be fine. Just go into it with a plan. Make sure you've got a plan. And my friend said, uh, remember Mike Tyson said, plans are things that you have with you until someone punches you in the face. <laughs> and directing is essentially like being punched in the face every day. That's what it felt like. Uh, I, but a weird one where later on you go, and I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, and also people would say, well, you've been on sets all your life. I'm sure it'll be fine. No, it in no way prepares you for it. Um, uh, but this, because this, I mean, it's it, weirdly, it's it feels so personal to me, even though I, you know, I, I mean, I was part of developing it, but I didn't write it. James wrote it. But it, it, it feels like such a personal part. You know, obviously, it's set in the town that I grew up in, that I live in again now. It's about themes that I'm, you know, fascinated by and that mean a lot to me. Um, the people in it, you know, a lot of the actors have been friends of mine, you know, a lot of my life. Um, so, it, you know, it feels very real. I mean, that penguin that we go down the mouth of, uh, I've got in my back garden. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it does feel incredibly personal. So I think that makes, a, that makes a big difference, obviously, that being able to pour so much of yourself into it. Um, and uh, funny enough, people said, oh, well, you know, you'll be fine with the actors, of course, working with the actors. And that was the bit I was most nervous of, really, because I didn't want to, you know, get anything wrong. And, and the one thing I just sort of kept saying to myself was the thing that I find most beneficial for me when I'm acting is that I, I feel ownership of the character, that I can, that my instincts can, can you know, flow through what I'm doing. And that the times when I've had a, a problem with direction is when it has got in the way of that. It somehow made me kind of second guess and think, oh, I'm, I don't really understand this character or whatever. So I knew that was the one thing I, I, I needed to try and make sure was in place for the actors. Um, and... Uh, uh, and you know when you when you uh, Stephen Frears used to say to me, oh, it's just you just cast it right. And if you cast it right, that's it. Um, <laughs> and I can, I mean, he's very self-deprecating when he says that. But I can sort of see what he means. You know, if you get the right actors, um, who are you know brilliant actors, but right for those parts and get it and understand it and have an instinct for it, then you know it, it's it does so much of the work for you. Um, so that helped as well. And and the other thing that people say is, oh, you know, the hard thing about directing is you've got people are asking you a hundred questions all the time. You know, what this or that? And did you find that overwhelming? And I really enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I like having control. <laughs> <laughs>
how you solve it, how you get out of it, which is really what I think we were trying to do in, in the whole thing. And, and Callum's character is the centre of that. And they, they got it. They really liked it. One of the things that we talked about from the very beginning was, wasn't it? The, the idea I kept saying this, and, and Adam was like, "Oh yeah, no, that's really good." That it's you know it should feel like a horror film at times. Like I always talked about Stephen King and how he sort of uh, makes things like time malignant in certain stories, or you know, a town can have a sort of something undercurrent, something underneath it, and I sort of always liked the idea of that of the that the place itself had something kind of maybe that was dormant that people thought had gone but was still sort of there and it's starting to wake up and starting to kind of ooze into the streets again and that kind of thing so that sort of sense of creeping menace that's throughout the piece mm. was very conscious i mean that was you know um and how to sort of balance that and how to make that work and still not feel like that you're you know you're being put you're on the outside of the story but that sense of something again we chose for it to be where it was because there are there are the ghosts of, of, of times past, you know, the minor strike and these these different things that get talked about in the piece. That there's a kind of a there's something there that could that could rise again, kind of thing. And 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 I I like that. I was drawn to that idea, mm -hmm. and I think James and Adam, you know, we all were drawn to that sort of sense. Weren't we? Yeah, these sort of hidden forces that pulsate through a, a, a culture or a nation. And actually, the weirdest thing for us, and I don't say this in a a boastful, oh, we were so clever way. But because it takes so fucking long to someone to make a TV drama, um, events kept catching up with us because we, we like, especially Adam, who's got a sense of these things about the mood and how it shifts, we would write something that would feel implausible. And sometimes we'd get like notes saying, it feels, this, this feels quite implausible. Like, uh, you can't just lock down Wales and make people stay in their house for a while. <laughs> uh, we wrote in 2018 and then suddenly that happens and you have to escalate and escalate. We actually wrote, um, we actually came up with the scenario of people erupting in, a, in an industrial action in, in strike across the country. Actually, because we felt the antipathy that people were just not mobilizing anymore in, in class action. And then suddenly Mick Lynch turns up and everyone's on strike. So we, we kept having to react. And actually, we, you know, we started working on this in 2017 and we only filmed it last year. So we kept having to um, yeah, respond. And I think all you can do in that situation is, is as Adam says, is, is try to reflect where the mood is and the feeling is uh, rather than the specifics. But I'm absolutely deleting my Dropbox folder because I think it's haunted and something is like <laughs> emanating out of it. But it's um, yeah, it was exciting to be on that. It's exciting to be um, predicting things that kept, you know, as a mood kept evolving and, and coming true. I think that the, the new politics is about mood. Old political drama was always telling you the stories of political infighting or, or political dynasties. Or what what is really powerful now is a mood. Um, the post office one got a mood because what it did is it dramatized in an extreme way that mood that everyone feels, but the computer says no. You know, you're always on the line. No, the computer says no, and that the people at the other side of power, the people the other side of the computer, and there's a thing between you. It dramatized that mood. And as I was saying to that questioner over there, is that what I think we've sort of achieved by luck as much as anything else, is that sort of jumping around in, in style and in mood, and a sense that Callum's character, going from feeling nothing to suddenly feeling something, captures a sense of mood and a sense of possibility. And I think that's political now in a way that old dramas, old political dramas don't get. And so I'm quite, I'm really quite proud of that. I'm proud of the vibe, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 that's the way people relate to each other these days. And that's where the new politics is going to come from, I think. And I think we're sort of just touching on that a bit. It does feel like a completely new type of thing, a new type of story to a new vibe to me. Well, I mean, increasingly as the story goes on, you realise that one of the big questions that the, the story is asking is, what, how, do you, how do you do the new? How do you leave the old behind? Yeah. How, do you, how do, do, you, do you have the audacity, the courage, the whatever it is, to do something new? And, um, 
uh, and and when when all we do is sort of recycle the old and uh, and that we see that playing out as the piece goes along more and more um so it's not necessarily saying what the new is but the callum's character owen ultimately is able to step into the new there's that gramsci quote about you know the old is dying and yet the new cannot yet be born and it's in that gap that <clears throat> fascism or whatever you know can can emerge um but that sense of being in that place of between old and new and that we're sort of living in that place somehow and and that's part of what sort of this story opens up into as it goes along